here. <clears throat> All right, so we're still on book one, um, entitled God and Man, and book one specifically God. Book two is also entitled God and Man, but it deals specifically with the nature of man. So we are dealing with the nature of God in book one, uh, written by Dr. Ambrosio Gonzalez de Valle back in 1965. Um, it, it is an old book, but this is, this is timeless theology and philosophy that is here um, in, in, in the material, as you saw from the initial presentation. Uh, so we talked about the nature of God, and we talked about the attributes of God. That's the first half of the book. The second half discusses a, a lot about faith, mystery, uh, and revelation, in particular uh, the Trinity. But we went from under, uh, try, we went from going to uh, um, an understanding, a determination of a supreme being, that there is a God in the universe, and what those attributes of that God are. Essentially, using our rational faculties and, and creation, some of those attributes did uh, presuppose revelation. For instance, God is one. There is no reason. There's nothing that reason would arrive by just reviewing nature that there's only one God. And we kind of see that in history, as I mentioned, a lot of uh, pre-Christian religions, pagan religions have multiple gods and multiple entities. The Jews are really, uh, or Judaism is really one of the first religions that I can think of off the top of my head that has monotheism as a result of revelation. Um, that's why, that's one of, so those, those are one of the attributes of God that presupposes uh, faith, if you will, in the sense of revelation. So anyway, the first part was about reason, how we can arrive at a supreme being and the attributes of God. The second half of this book will touch on faith, as I mentioned. Uh, faith in particular, uh, and different types of faith. And we see here, we, use, we have different uses for the word faith. Uh, I have faith as, as it's something I possess, as a noun, for instance. Uh, people of faith, men of faith, I belong to the faith, the Catholic faith, or the, Jude, the, the Jewish faith, right? So different uses of faith, or I hold steadfast to the faith. Um, but we're going to talk in specifically about the act of faith. What it means, what is the act of faith? How does that manifest itself? And there's two different types of acts of faith that Dr. Ambrosio talks about. That's human faith and divine faith. But real quick, let's take a quick look here at, because uh, Dr. Ambrosio goes a little bit into what faith is not, right? And that's, and I, I pulled some of these definitions from um, Miriam Webster. So faith is complete trust. Here, this is firm belief in something for which there is no proof, okay? That is not what faith is. This is a definition that's in Miriam Webster, but that is not what faith is. Faith elevates reason. Faith begins from reason. We'll get there. So there has to be proof. Well, um, and, and Dr. Ambrosio says, f blind faith is not what we teach. Our Catholic Catholicism is not a blind faith for which there is no rational adherence, no rational proof. There's another uh, definition there, something that you do without question. Again, and Father Science did a great homily one time, uh, I think it was in relation to Downing Thomas, that it, there is healthy doubt that it is not necessarily unhealthy to doubt. As long as you are searching and questioning and your reason is seeking answers, that is healthy. So we don't have blind faith. Now this is what superstition is, and you'll kind of see, if, if faith is a firm belief in something for which there is no proof, you're not too far away from superstition. A belief or practice resulting from ignorance, chance, a false conception of causation. And I think in our modern secular world, we blur, we blur the lines quite a bit. I think sometimes there's also a fear of the unknown and we, uh, we, we jump onto faith as though it, God is, has a magic wand, right? We, sometimes we fall into that prayer that it's magical. And then if we pray, we say enough prayers and we say it to the right uh, entity or to the saint, if you will, that, if we, that there's some kind of magic behind it. And that's it's an improper understanding of what the act of faith is. So it is not blind faith. It, there is certainly proof. It's tied to reason. Uh, it begins in reason, actually. And human faith is sort of a confidence or trust that we have in one another or in the things that we learn or the things that we see. And there's everyday actions of faith. And if you go to the grocery store 
And if you buy a can of beans, you have faith. The can of beans comes closed, it has a label on the outside. You don't see what's inside that can, right? You don't see it. There's a label. You, you trust the fact that you shop at Publix or Winn-Dixie or Sedanios. You trust the manufacturer, Goya, El Ebro, whatever it is. You trust the label. You trust the stockers. So you put faith in the manufacturer, the distributor, and the seller. There's a certain act of human faith that goes on when you buy a can of beans that you can't see the thing that's inside of it, right? Certain thing with gasoline. You, you're not testing the gasoline as you're pouring. Yeah, you can smell it, right? But you're not testing if that's really gasoline, if it's mixed with something else that you're not about. It has some additives that you're not aware of. They're mixing water. You don't know that. Did anybody here meet Cervantes, see him write this book? It's an act of human faith that we take for granted, if you will, that we all believe that Cervantes wrote Don Quixote. We all believe in Pi, if Mueller's not here, right? Nobody, if you take the circumference of a circle, any circle divided by its diameter, you get Pi for every single circle that has ever, you can draw. You can draw a million circles, you run that formula, you're gonna get the number Pi, 3.14, no se que mas. Okay, that's an act of faith. You're not going to test every circle into, um, you know, you be here to infinity. But it's an act of faith. And children also, right? Children are taught by their teachers two plus two equals four. They don't really know. It's in teacher, children are taught that these machines, these, these, these things emit electromagnetic waves, radio waves. We design machines that submit radio waves and we design machines that pick up radio waves Tra transform the radio waves to sound waves and then things we can hear. Children learn about this stuff, they just take it for granted, right? The human acts of faith, but oddly enough, when you open the can of black beans and you see it's black beans, you don't need faith anymore. You've shown, no. It is what it, is what it says it is, right? The child, two plus two equals four, they start bringing up their fingers, they start counting apples, two plus two equals four. I don't necessarily need to have faith, so to speak, in the equation. I know what it is. So human faith, in a sense, kind of comes to a, a, bit of a, a, a bit of a conclusion, right? We, we, we achieve a point where we don't necessarily always rely on faith. We do, we have an act of human faith, but we don't always rely on it. But, so, but what are the things that allow us to make that act of faith? And we're still kind of on, on human faith. And so, um, so the world is, is created full of things that we learn about, right? Much of, much of which we do take upon faith. Nobody here has ever measured the distance from the earth and the sun. But you look up in a textbook and you see what it is, 90 million miles, whatever it is, and you say, oh, the distance from the earth to the sun is 90 million miles. How do, we, how do we know that? Well, somebody that you have credibility in, it's a textbook from some uh, astronomer or cosmologist, somebody who measured this, measured the distance of the light, the, the speed of the light or whatnot, and you, you so it's, an, it's a motive of credibility. You have no reason to doubt the information that's coming to you. You're not going to measure it yourself. You don't have the instruments. So you take an act of faith in the textbook or the, 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 the information that you get from. You have an act of faith in that. Also, nobody here has seen the Opportunity rover on Mars, right? We see pictures of it in the news. We hear in the NASA that there is an actual object on Mars, which is I don't know how many miles away from us, but none of us have seen it. None of us have conducted a science experiment, have gone to Mars and checked it out. It's an act of faith based on the credibility of the people that inform us, much like a student takes what their professor says and has credibility at that professor. So it's an act of faith. It's a motive of credibility. Uh, and that's, that's what we would call an internal motive of credibility. Professor Mueller, when he talks about philosophy or when he talks about astronomy uh, or he talks about the, the general theory of relativity, we, who are not necessarily informed on those topics, take Mueller and have faith in what he says. Because he's credible. We know who he is. We know his character. We know where he studied. We know his resume. We know his experience. So there's a motive of credibility. That's what's called the internal motive of credibility. Now there's also an external motive of credibility, and those are essentially the production. We know um, production would be something that the individual produces, right? So the, if you go back to the, the uh, black bean analogy, you like this particular brand of black beans, El Elgro. You buy them all the time, you open them, it's always black beans, always black beans, always black beans. I guarantee you, you buy a can of black beans from El Elbro one day, you open it and they're garbanzos, you're going to lose faith in El Elbro. Your human faith in that brand, I'm not going to buy that brand anymore because I opened what I thought was black beans and they were garbanzos. I'm going to lose faith in that. 
Uh, just like the sales guy who gets you the, ex you know, you're going to go buy a car and the salesman promises the exact car you want with all the trims and finishes for the exact price that you want. You end up with a car that you didn't really ask for, for a price that you weren't willing to pay. Well, you're going to lose faith in that sales guy. If you need immigration service and you go to a lawyer and he says, I know all about immigration law and you go to your first hearing and you realize this lawyer don't know squat about immigration law, you're going to lose faith in that lawyer. So these are the external, right? The, you may have, the lawyer may give you all the resumes and on paper he looks awesome. Internally, he's got a good reputation. When he comes to produce his external mode of credibility, doesn't, it falls real short. So you're going to lose faith in that person. Um, it, so there's a lot of examples about that and the motives of credibility and where we make these human acts of faith on a daily basis. And there's still a lot of things, that, and as I mentioned, sometimes we don't, you know, our f human acts of faith, we don't need them anymore. You open the can of black beans, you know the math, um, you, 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 know, you know, you have uh, an attorney who is indeed a good immigration lawyer. Your faith is no longer needed. Your human act of faith is no longer needed. Um, but there's still a lot about our life that requires these human acts of faith. Medicine is one, right? Especially for cancer patients. Sometimes if you're getting treated by cancer, a loved one's getting treated by cancer, sometimes the medicine works, sometimes it doesn't. The doctors can't always guarantee that, listen, we found cancer, it's liver cancer, we're gonna treat it, and you're gonna be cured. No doctor will tell you that. Because they don't, you know, we don't really, we don't have a full grasp uh, of the science behind the medicine. So, we take it on a leap of faith, and sometimes some of us recover, some folks don't. But this is a good segue into the next type of faith that Dr. Ambrosio goes into, which is divine faith. And if, if, it really, you know, for those of us that are not necessarily practicing Catholics, if you're dealt with a crisis, a health crisis, you're going to have faith in your doctors, but then you're also going to have faith in the big guy. You're going to have divine, you're going you're to reach out to that divine faith. So, um, so, you know, so there's reason and there's faith. And as John Paul II tells us in the great encyclical Fetus et Ratio, these are like two wings of the human spirit by which it soars to truth, right? So, so we're not blind faith. We don't just believe in things just because we want to. We don't make things up. We don't believe in unicorns. I have faith that unicorns exist. What reason do you have to even believe you'll see a unicorn? You have faith that there's an opportunity, there's a rover on Mars called Opportunity because you have motives of credibility to believe that. And if you ever go to Mars, you may see one and you'll no longer need to have faith, it's there. You, if you have faith that unicorns exist, based on what reason? So that would be sort of like a blind faith. But so reason, and so faith elevates reason. It always begins with reason. You have to have a rational motive, right? What are your credible motives to believe something to then put your faith into that? So, Going into divine faith, and Dr. Ambrosio spends quite a bit of time now um, in divine faith, and there are, again, we'll go into uh, two different motives of credibility for the divine faith, the internal and the external motives um, of, of credibility. And the divine faith refers precisely to the, the, the Creator to God, to salvation history, to redemption. Um, things that we can't arrive at just by our natural uh, observance of the world and interactions with human beings. There's a lot we can determine. But again, without revelation, there's a lot that we just simply don't know. We don't know about salvation history without revelation. We don't know about sin without revelation. We don't know about forgiveness. We don't, know, we don't even know about, uh, you one could say, we don't even know about um, heaven or hell without revelation. We need revelation for these things. And so the, some internal credibility as it regards divine faith would be the, the person of Jesus Christ that we read, right? We, we, we hear about a good person that does good things, that does acts of charity, the care and concern. And there is no reason, that, you know, if, if we take the Bible and the life of history, sort of, uh, the life of Jesus sort of as a history, it's not like um, you're reading about Hitler, right? You, this dude is not credible, right? It's, you're reading about a person that every, everything you read about Jesus, you would say, it's a credible guy. If you were to read about him as a, as a person of history. And the same thing, the church, the internal credibility of the church. This is not an institution that popped up yesterday. This is an institution that's been around for 2,000 years, that has tradition, that, that has um, tradition that's papered, right? We can follow it back. We can trace it back to its roots 
It's in history. It's been verified. So these are, these are internal motives of credibility for our church. And then external motives, which we'll get into a little bit more in depth, would be things like miracles and, and prophecies. Um, and let's go into that a little bit. So external motives of credibility, and I'm going to go through this uh, rather quickly because I don't want to spend too much time on what exactly a miracle is. But uh, So external motives of credibility for believing in Revelation, and specifically Jesus Christ, are the miracles. And what are some internal characteristics? Direct intervention from God and His omnipotence. In other words, it's an act that can't be explained by nature. And most of what we see oftentimes are medical miracles. And um, there's a whole team in, in the Vatican that addresses medical miracles because one of the things that we want to rule out is, is this essentially a natural occurrence that the observer didn't realize at first. The observer sees it as a miracle. He was praying for it. But if we take a closer look, it's not necessarily a direct intervention from God, but it's actually just nature. And it's, maybe he, there's human reason behind it. And um, our medicines or whatnot that we understand nature more in depth and we're able to do that. So it has to be a direct intervention from God and it has to be His loving providence with creatures and man, right? Um, no, no malice would be, nothing, no malice in the world would be ever discussed to be a miracle. So, right, the, the, you wouldn't say the death of Osama bin Laden is a miracle, right? Because it's, it's, it's just not, it's nothing that has to deal with the loving providence of God with His creatures and man. Not even Fidel Castro's death. Maybe there's some exception for some of us in the room. Right. Um, and that super, uh, the, the supernatural origin of the truth. So the miracle reveals the, the, the supernatural origin of, of, of truth. External characteristics of a miracle. Sensible, wonderful, and exceptional event. Right. Um, so the sun rising is not a miracle. The sun setting is not a miracle. Right, uh, the the tides are not miracles. Waves are not earthquakes. And her, these are hurricanes. This, some of these things are not necessarily miracles. They have to be wonderful, awe-inspiring events. Um, the the host that we sense, our senses see as bread and wine turning into actual flesh and body, uh, blood. I'm sorry. So the uh, awe-inspiring, ex uh, wonderful, exceptional events. Or the sun dancing, as in Fatima, right? The sun dancing in, around in, in, in the sky. And then they have to be superior to the order of nature. Um, so something, again, that you wouldn't necessarily witness uh, in the sun dancing in the sky. Something that you wouldn't witness uh, in nature. And another external mode of credibility would be prophecies. And we see these... Um, so we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. So what are some characteristics of prophecies? Clear and precise... You know, these are not ambiguous things that, you know, well, maybe this will happen, maybe that won't happen. You know, Dr. Ambrosio uh, says these are not what fortune tellers are doing, but as, as we see in the Bible, clear and precise things. Destroys this temple in three days, I will raise it up again. Uh, the future event must, not, must be hidden, right? So in a sense, this is not a prediction. Science can predict a lot of things. So the prophet, you know, the sun will rise tomorrow. That's not a prophecy, right? That's... Just a pretty good prediction. Um, or, you know, that you will recover from a cold or something like that, right? So these things must be hidden that without God revealing them, we would not know. And the prophecies of um, Fatima come to mind. Um, the, the fall of communism, we would know that, right? So things that must be hidden. And clearly seen as originating from God to confirm anything necessary for salvation and consolidation of our faith. So... Prophecies have to touch on the topic of salvation and, um, and our faith. All right, so, so divine faith um, is more different from human faith. You know, we talked about how uh, faith, uh, whether human faith or divine faith, builds on reason. And our rational faculties, our motives for credibility, motives for believing something will happen that we put, then put faith in that. Um, uh, bringing us to human faith or divine faith. So, but where do the motives of credibility come from for us as Catholic? The internal and external motives of credibility. Where does revelation come from? Where do we get our revelation? And that's pretty clear for some of us. We've talked a lot about this. Revelation does come from nature. Creation, interactions with human beings. These are natural things from which we can discern the existence of God and the nature of God and the nature of human beings. Nature. 
That's indirect. But if that was all we had, we would have a natural religion. We wouldn't have a revealed, that's what we have, we have a revealed, the Judeo-Christian tradition is a revealed religion. So God did not want us to stop just at what we can discern from nature, which is why God intervened in human history with the people of Israel and ultimately with Jesus Christ. God wanted to reveal to us more about who we are and importantly, why we were created. See, the natural discernment can tell us the how, if you will, of creation, the how of who we are, but not the why. We don't really know, if we look at reason and we see the supreme being, we can't really tell why a supreme being decided to do all of this, why we interact with one another the way we interact, why we have the emotions we have. We need revelation to give us that. So God gives us revelation, right, through scripture and tradition. We're going to focus primarily on scripture here. And um, scripture, the Bible, the revealed word of God that has come through us through four or 5,000 years of oral and written history from the Jews and through, through our Christian religion and, and the gospel. So focusing on particularly, we talked nature, we're going to focus on revelation in the Bible. And why does Dr. Ambrosio say um, we can rely on, on the Bible? Well, first, it's authentic. The actual written scripture, the actual books of the Bible are authentic. There have been studies over the years, exegetical studies, on where these writings came from, where they were found, who wrote them. Linguistic studies through various translations that can attribute these particular writings to cultures, tie them to various traditional practices, to various works of art that existed contemporaneous with these writings, and tie them to the places and events. So these things have been determined to be authentic writings not something that somebody wrote in the year 1100 when I believe the Bible actually was confirmed as, as an actual book sometime along the year 1100. But these things have existed long before then and we can confirm that these writings have existed long before we actually put together what we call the Bible. So they are authentic writings. They weren't um, something that was created again in the year 1300 or the year 600 or 700. These things were authentic and written around contemporaneous events and they're integral. They have not been altered in content. We have very ex extant editions of, of the Bible. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance. We have various manuscripts of the, old, of the New Testament. And, the, and although we have various translations, the content is the same. You have a question? The content is the same, right? Some of the translation may change, but we don't all of a sudden like, oh, there's a new translation of the Bible. In that new translation, Jesus does a new miracle. That doesn't happen, right? Or Jesus was born in Nazareth, not or Bethlehem, right? So while we have various traditions, the integral story never changes. We don't have more or less miracles. We don't have a different story of Jesus. Jesus all of a sudden doesn't have a bunch of siblings in numerous translations. So it's an integral writing. And it's truthful because of the first-hand accounts. So there's, like I said, various historical, uh, so, cr historical critical accounts of the Bible that can date these writings to the uh, first century, contemporaneous to shortly after the death of Jesus. And there's also what Dr. Ambrosio points out, third-party acknowledgments. So various, Greco various Roman writers at the time, historical Roman writers, would reference these, um, not necessarily the Bible, right? They wouldn't say, oh, and, and we read the New Testament. But there's various third-party acknowledgments about these actual events that are also included in the Bible. So these third-party acknowledgments of these events that are written in the Bible lends, to, lends credibility to its truthfulness, right? So um, if you haven't picked up the Bible, go ahead and read it because uh, it's truthful, it's integral, and it's authentic. And that's where we get our, our revelation from. So what do we see in the Bible? Well, we learn about the person of Jesus Christ. He makes various proclamations. He was the Messiah as awaited from all time from the Jewish, um, from the Jewish um, tradition. All the prophecies of the Old Testament have been fulfilled. He says he's the Son of God. He says he uh, will resurrect. He says he's the way, the truth, and the life. He says whoever does not eat his flesh and drink his blood will not have eternal life. He says he's the only source of supernatural life. He forgives sins. He says he is God. He has the power to pardon sins. He conquered the world. He's the king. So these are all proclamations that Jesus Christ makes in these scriptures. 
What are the miracles that Jesus per, per, uh, gives us? So two things. Um, he produced... Huh? Cana, right. The, first, the very first miracle, turning water, water into wine. But interesting enough, he does these miracles in his name, and that's what's critical. Jesus, he, does, he says, at least, the, at least believe the works that I do, so you may know and understand the Father is in me and I in him. The works that I do, right? So Jesus is saying he has, he himself, as the God-man, has the authority to, per to perform these miracles. And compare that, uh, Dr. Ambrosio says, to the words of St. Peter in the Acts of the Apostles, where he approaches a... Um, a crippled man, crippled man from birth at, at the temple. The, he, he tells the crippled man, yeah, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. Right? So Jesus in the scripture says, I myself believe my works. I am God. The Father is in me and I am in the Father. And I do these things. And then post-Jesus, we, the apostles, do it in the name of Jesus Christ. So those miracles, so uh, uh, we don't attribute the Godhead to Peter even though he does miracles, we attribute it to Jesus Christ, in whose name he does the miracles. The same thing with the saints. And then he also has a variety of prophecies, the messianic prophecies, watch all in the Old Testament. And so, so the early, the apostles were all Jews, for the most part, as far as we understand, they were all Jews. And they had faith in their Jewish tradition that God would send a Messiah. Revealed faith. They read the Old Testament. And they see the prophets, they see Isaiah, they read the prophets. They, and so when they come to believe in Jesus Christ, their faith in the Messiah is fulfilled. They no longer need faith in the Messiah. Just like we no longer, when we open the can of black beans, we no longer need faith. There they are, the black beans. When the Jew, early apostles who are Jews, who are holding on to the Messianic tradition, see Jesus and believe in Jesus, their faith is fulfilled. Now their faith is not in the Messianic prophecies, which Jesus is filled, but it's in Jesus Christ himself. They have that faith in Jesus, in his works, in his deeds, in his promise of eternal life, and in his resurrection. And, and we'll get to the resurrection, I believe, right now, right? So mere Christianity is a... Uh, we'll get to the resurrection. Mere Christianity I brought up because we studied this book a while back, a few years ago, but in it, uh, C.S. Lewis says, look, Jesus is not Mahatma Gandhi, right? And St. Paul says, if Jesus doesn't resurrect... You know, forget it. This is all garbage. If Jesus doesn't resurrect, maybe some scriptures would, maybe some writings of Jesus would have survived. Maybe. And he would be the Mahatma Gandhi of the first century, which is a great guy who ran around, did a bunch of great things. But if he hadn't resurrected, he certainly wouldn't be the Messiah. And the Jews today would still be holding on to that messianic prophecy. <clears throat> but C.S. Lewis says, if you, you, can't, you can only believe two things about Jesus. He's absolutely crazy and he's a lying, fabricating idiot. Or he's the Son of God. If you're going to read the Gospels, those are the only two conclusions. You can't believe he's a Mahatma Gandhi. You can't believe he's Confucius. You can't believe he's just another great moral teacher. And that resurrection thing just kind of like, yeah, it was just thrown in there for, you know, good measure. No. Either, if, you, if you're going to take it seriously, either he's batshit crazy, or he is in what he says he is, and that's the Messiah. That's it. That's what C.S. Lewis says. And C.S. Lewis says, Jesus wouldn't have it any other way. Jesus don't want... And, and I, I always go back to... Yeah, right. I, I, I always go back to the rich man. You know, Jesus does not compromise. The rich man, oh, I want to follow you, Jesus. He says, sell everything and come to after me. And the old rich man goes away sad because Jesus doesn't bargain with the guy. Sell half of what you have. Sell a third of what you have. Sell a half of what Jesus doesn't compromise, right? It's, you can almost say it's not a scale of morality. Jesus doesn't care about the scale of morality. You either follow me or you don't. Right? So Jesus wants it that way. You want to think I'm crazy? Go ahead. It's up to you, right? But I'm doing what I'm doing. You either believe I'm crazy or you believe in the Son of God. So C.S. Lewis gives us that's Pascal's rager. Pascal says, you know, you can either bet that when you close your eyes, there will be an ultimate heaven, and you can leave for, and you can live for that. That's the bet, the wager. Because if you don't live for heaven, and there is a hell, then you've lost everything. Because if you, if you, but if you live for heaven, then you're, you, you're going to gain a whole lot. Right? But if you wager against, you're going to lose a lot. So the same, C.S. Lewis is saying the same thing. Either Jesus is crazy, or he's the Son of God. So, but the resurrection, as St. Paul says, is really um, the culmination of all of Jesus' prophecies and miracles. Again, without it, Jesus just did a bunch of 
awesome things and he's a great Mahatma Gandhi. And um, we would, or may, maybe or maybe not, we would know about him. But um, the resurrection is the, the focal point of our faith as Catholics. Without it, there is no act of faith. Again, right? The Jews, when Jesus resurrected, that messianic faith in Jesus is fulfilled. It's fulfilled. We no longer have that faith. We don't, we're not holding on to the, the messianic faith. We hold on to the faith of Jesus Christ, the promises of Jesus Christ. And, um, I, and, and I wanted to say this, right? Human faith gets fulfilled. You open the can of beans, you understand math, you see the opportunity to rover on Mars. We fulfill human faith. At some point, we no longer need it. Divine faith, we will get there. The scripture says, faith, hope, and love, the three theological virtues, all that remain are love. At some point, when we are in heaven, we no longer need the faith of the promises of Jesus Christ. Right now, though, we do need that faith, right? And, and Revelation, and there's, the, there's a bit of that mystery there, that our reason, as much as we can understand about God, as much as Revelation gives us, there's always something that we don't know. We don't know the full truths of our faith, even through Revelation. We don't know the full truth of the, of the miracles that happened. We don't know the ex full truth of the Trinity. We don't know the full truth of the resurrection or the glorified body. We don't know these things, and we can't. We cannot know them. Reason alone, will, and, and our faith here, our human, it just will not get there until our resurrection, until we are in heaven. Then the divine faith, we will have no more need for it. We need that divine faith while we're here on earth to elevate the reason that we currently have in order to um, maintain uh, the belief in the promises of Jesus Christ. And um, Dr. Ambrosio goes through a series of things in that book. I don't know if you guys read it. I'm not going to go through them in, in, in too much detail. But um, he challenges certain things that people say, well, the resurrection was a conspiracy. They obviously, the apostles, you know, went and stole Jesus' body. And then they disposed of it. And that's why we don't have Jesus' body. It wasn't because he resurrected. And then he goes through a series of arguments of why, the consp why that conspiracy doesn't hold water. Um, one of the better ones I like is because the Gospels tell us that the apostles fled Jesus when he was put up on the cross. They all, they all were scared for their lives. They ran. They denied him. So if they deny Jesus and they don't even really believe, they, they had no clue that Jesus was going to die on the cross. I mean, Jesus sort of prophesied that to them, but they didn't grasp that. So they fled Jesus, they deny Jesus, and there's this huge scare that if you're with Jesus, you're going to be next. So why in the heck would they go steal his body and put themselves at risk? It doesn't make any sense. And then, of course, oh, well, the guards were sleeping, uh, and therefore they didn't. The, so the guards were sleeping. How do they even know anybody stole Jesus' body? How do you push away the rock? And then you fold the linens up after you take Jesus' body, you fold it up nice and neat. So, so Dr. Ambrosio says, you know, there's no way that a conspiracy theory that somehow the apostles of the first century uh, conspired to create the resurrection of Jesus. And how do we as men who understand how conspiracies work and how many people it takes to actually make a conspiracy hold water, believe that that's going to maintain 2,000 years, right? I mean, we, we hear in the Gospels that 500 people witnessed the, resurre witnessed the, the, the resurrected Jesus, as many as 500 people during those 40 days. So somebody would have fessed up, Dr. Ambrosio says. There's no way that many people would have all conspired together to maintain this huge secret that we took Jesus' body from the tomb, buried it where it never be found again, and pretended that he resurrected. And then, of course, there's this hallucination theory, and hypno hypnosis theory. Um, there's a brief write-up there. We won't go too far into that. But it, those are also things that um, Dr. Ambrosio debunks as far as the, the, the act of the resurrection. And then um, Dr. Ambrosio ends with, with the Trinity. Um, again, this is revelation, divine faith. There is nothing that our human reason, by observing interactions with each other or, the, or nature, that we would ever devise on our own that God is Trinitarian. That God is one God but three persons. This is a, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ who repeatedly says, um, whoever sees me sees the Father. That uh, the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And that we will send the Holy Spirit to be with you. So these, this is Revelation. And then Jesus, of course, says that he desires for us to be one with him as he is one with the Father. Um, and so the, the Trinity being one God, three persons, 
It's the same essence. We talked a little bit about this, uh, that each person is not, um, a, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? It's not a, an extension of the other. And there's no succession either. Um, that the one person being, succession meaning first there was God, and then there was Jesus, and then there was the Holy Spirit, right? One being better than the other. There's no succession. This is three persons, one God from eternity, all at the same time, consubstantial, one with the other. Um, and if it, I, I, I personally enjoy reading the theology, so we have this understanding that God is the creator, right? And Father Science talked a little bit about how we reference God and why we reference God in the male pronoun as the giver, the giver of creation, right? And, and that God has this perfect intuition of his own nature, of, of who he is. He's so complete, immeasurable, omniscient, omni, omnipotent, and, this, and, and his own idea of himself begets the Son, the Logos, the Word. So in, in Ambrosio, Dr. Ambrosio talks a little bit about this. We have ideas in our mind, right? We have ideas that do not spontaneously do, you know, we have an idea for a book. If we have an idea for a book, it just doesn't, like, spontaneously appear, right? This idea, and again, if we have ideas, we have to voice these ideas, right? That, so there's this tie between, this is a way of understanding, there's this tie between the idea that God the Father has this perfect idea of himself, and that God the Son is, is this manifestation of this perfect idea of, of God the Father, is the Logos, the Word, right, from eternity. And um, why is there not more than, more than one person? Why is there not more than one Son? Why are there, why are there not four people? Why are there not four persons or five persons in the Trinity or six persons? Well, because again, this is Revelation. Jesus says there's only three. Baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I am in the Father, the Father is in me. And the Revelation limits this understanding, right? We have what I'm talking to you about in the three persons and consubstantial and equal. This is all as a result of what Jesus tells us in the Scripture. This is not based on reason that we have uh, naturally. So there are only three persons because that's only what Jesus reveals to us. And then the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, not from the Father and from the Son, right? From the Father and the Son. And the language is very philosophically, theologically critical because if you do from the Father and from the Son, it's as though there are two separate entities who collaborate together to have the Holy Spirit. So um, it proceeds from the Father and the Son, not from just the Father. That's our Orthodox uh, brethren, and that's what's called the phililoque controversy. So our, our, some of our Orthodox brethren believe that the Holy Spirit proceeds only from the Father and not from the Father and the Son. So in Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. They are uh, distinct persons, one essence, one entity, no succession. And there are various attributions, internal attributions God creates. The Son redeems, the Holy Spirit sanctifies. But these are internal attributes, right? So we don't speak of God the Father as the Creator, as though He's a separate independent being, and then God the Son as He's a separate independent being redeeming, and then God the Holy Spirit as a separate independent being here. When we speak of these attributes, these are internal attributes of the personhood of the one God. But God as creator acts as one. God as redeemer acts as one. God as sanctifier acts as one. So, uh, not, so this is just, so we don't confuse the idea, and although we see in these um, icons, we see three entities, right? So I think uh, it's hard. How do you depict three persons in one God and not depict three different entities? Well, I don't know. And uh, I don't know that any of our iconographers know as well. But the idea is that we don't, have three gods. It's one God, three persons, each with distinct properties in and of themselves, but acting externally out of themselves, they always act as one God. So to summarize, faith, two different types of faith, human faith, divine faith. Faith always follows from reason. We are not a blind faith religion. Reason is always involved. We must devise um, a creator, we must devise uh, 
the attributes of God using our natural faculties. And we test revelation. There's internal credibility. There's external credibility that we test revelation to determine, is this something that reason, our reason, is prepared to assent to? Because, uh, so reason then, faith then builds on reason. We don't prove, we cannot prove here in this life the existence of the Trinity. We cannot prove here in this life the existence of God. We cannot prove here in this life um, the resurrection. We cannot prove the glorified body. We cannot prove the existence of the soul. We can prove that there are black beans in a can. We just open them. We can prove there's gasoline when you pour it. We can test it. Human faith can be proven. Divine faith is a gift from God, and it must be sustained and practiced, and it will not be consummated, if you will, until we experience that divine life in heaven. So that's it for book one. And from there, next week, we will del delve into the nature of man. So questions, comments, accusations? <laughs> 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 so,